A number of important infectious diseases can affect poultry and other birds. Avian influenza, also known as bird flu, and Newcastle disease are two such examples. Both diseases are caused by viruses that can spread between birds, either by direct contact between infected and non-infected birds, or by airborne spread of the virus. Disease can also be spread when people or objects that have contact with infected birds subsequently have contact with uninfected birds, unless proper decontamination procedures have been undertaken. Avian influenza can cause a variety of symptoms in infected birds. Sudden death, diarrhea, blue wattles and cones, respiratory distress, and neurological signs. Many birds can become infected and mortality rates can be high. Consequently, avian influenza outbreaks are of great commercial significance to the poultry industry. Avian influenza and Newcastle disease are also examples of zoonotic infections. That is, the virus that causes the disease in birds can pass from bird to man and cause clinical signs of illness in humans. This means that whenever people are exposed to infected birds, special precautions, such as the wearing of appropriate personal protective equipment, must be taken to ensure that infection is not passed from bird to man. Both Newcastle disease and avian influenza are examples of notifiable diseases. When any infection is identified, the state veterinary authorities must be notified immediately. Standard protocols exist in the United Kingdom and across states of the European Union for tackling outbreaks of these diseases. The most common approach to stamping out outbreaks of infection is to undertake the culling of all infected birds. Any birds which have been in direct contact with infected birds and in some cases to create a firewall by killing non-infected birds that are housed nearby the original source of infection. Many hundreds or thousands of birds may need to be culled in the event of an outbreak. It's important to be clear about objectives at the outset of any disease control program. In the UK, it's been decided that in any outbreak of avian influenza, there are three priorities. Number one, to protect worker safety by minimizing exposure to diseased birds and other sources of contamination. Number two, to achieve satisfactory disease control through rapid killing of birds and other susceptible species and minimizing the potential for further spread of infection. And number three, to protect the welfare of birds during culling by using welfare-friendly techniques that are compliant with the law. The United Kingdom legislation on killing birds for disease control is contained within the Welfare of Animals Slaughter or Killing Regulations 1995. The regulations require that no person involved in any process associated with the killing of animals for disease control shall cause or permit to be caused any avoidable excitement, pain or suffering to any animal. Schedule 9 of the regulations lists permitted methods of slaughtering or killing animals for disease control. One permitted method is the exposure to carbon dioxide or to a lethal concentration of other gases or gas mixtures. This training aid describes the safe and effective use of a gas mixture to kill birds. This technique was researched at Bristol University and subsequently developed in conjunction with staff of the State Veterinary Service and the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. The Humane Slaughter Association was also involved in the final stages of refinement. Argon is an inert gas which normally exists in small quantities in the air we inhale. It's odorless and colourless, and we're unable to detect it as we breathe it in. Carbon dioxide is also present in the air in tiny amounts. It's an acidic gas which can cause breathlessness and an unpleasant burning sensation in the airways. However, the low level of carbon dioxide used in this mixture ensures birds experience little discomfort. The mixture contains almost no oxygen. Mammals and birds exposed to such low oxygen concentrations 
rapidly become unconscious and die. A gas mixture of 80% argon and 20% carbon dioxide has been shown to be not distressing to animals, including poultry, as it contains a low concentration of carbon dioxide. Research has clearly demonstrated that given a free choice, turkeys leave an elevated roosting area and walk down a tunnel connected to a feeding area. They spontaneously enter this atmosphere, which contains a mixture of argon and carbon dioxide, and inhale the gas mixture without attempting to leave the enclosure. Subsequently, they become unconscious and die because the low oxygen concentration they're inhaling is insufficient to support life. Induction of unconsciousness with anoxia produces very similar signs to those seen when a bird is decapitated or has its neck dislocated. Approximately 30 seconds after exposure to the gas, most birds will begin to convulse. This is usually seen or heard as periods of wing flapping, which in some birds can be quite violent. However, research has shown that convulsions only commence after the bird has become unconscious, when it's unable to feel pain or experience any distress. With continued inhalation of the anoxic gas, the heart stops and the bird dies. Use of personal protective equipment, or PPE, is one of the most important control measures used to protect people from zoonotic infection when working on premises where birds are being culled to control infectious disease. Viruses such as those that cause avian influenza and Newcastle disease can present a significant zoonotic risk and therefore a threat to human health. It's essential that PPE is worn and used correctly at all times when there's a risk of exposure to infected birds. PPE is also worn to ensure that good biosecurity of the site is maintained. All people working or observing procedures on infected premises will be expected to wear, for biosecurity reasons, disposable overalls, gloves, and disinfectable wellingtons. The wellingtons should be worn under the legs of the disposable overalls to prevent contaminated material entering the boots. The overall should be the outer layer of clothing. And depending upon weather conditions, it may be necessary to wear warm and or waterproof clothing under this disposable layer. For all bird diseases, it's important that respiratory protective equipment, RPE, and eye protection is worn. A choice of RPE and eye protection, all of which meet the required standard of protection, is available from appropriate manufacturers. Examples of adequate RPE are disposable FFP3 face mask, which must be worn with suitable goggles, a full face mask fitted with a P3 filter. A full hood with a powered filter unit fitted with a P3 filter. Filters have a finite lifetime for effective operation. Refer to the manufacturer's instructions and discard safely any filters whose lifetime has been exhausted. Training on the use of this equipment, including proper selection and fitting, must be given to all staff who are required to use it before they move on to infected premises. The officer in charge of the infected premises will designate where PPE must be worn and will enforce the wearing of PPE. Typically, the wearing of coveralls, etc., will be required in all parts of the infected premises. The use of RPE and eye protection will be restricted to clearly identified areas of risk, such as within a poultry shed where infected birds are housed. All protective clothing should be put on before entering infected premises. RPE should be worn when on the infected premises and before entering areas of risk. When working with infected birds, Wellington boots, overalls and gloves may become contaminated with zoonotic or pathogenic material, as well as being covered in dust and other debris which should not be inhaled. All clothing and other equipment that may be potentially covered in infected material must not leave the infected premises. 
or else is a risk of spreading the disease onwards to other birds or humans. It's important that equipment and clothing is removed in the correct order. If disposable, PPE should be removed before leaving the infected premises and placed in yellow clinical waste sacks destined for incineration. If the clothing or equipment is not disposable, it must be carefully removed and any gross contamination brushed off. The equipment is then washed in a cleaning agent before it's disinfected using an approved disinfectant that will kill any infectious agent effectively. The following protocol should be adopted for removing PPE. First, remove the coverall or gown carefully and place this in the yellow clinical waste bag. Then remove your gloves, placing them in the bag. At this stage, wash and decontaminate your hands using a hand wash with antibacterial and antiviral properties to avoid contaminating your eyes and nose. Remove eye protection if it's separate from the mask. If eye protectors are reusable, place them in a separate container for cleansing and disinfection. Now carefully remove the mask, respirator or hood. Place the disposable FFP3 respirator in the bag containing the coveralls. If the filters in the reusable masks have been fully used, or it's the end of a working day, these should be disposed of safely. Reusable items should be placed in separate sacks for subsequent decontamination. Finally, wash your hands thoroughly again. The containerized gassing unit, or CGU, is a relatively simple piece of portable kit that can be moved from farm to farm to undertake the welfare-friendly killing of large numbers of poultry. It comprises a source of gas, usually contained in cylinders, a number of regulators, manifolds and high-pressure tubing to deliver the gas in a controlled fashion from the cylinders to the gassing chamber, a solid rectangular gas-tight steel container with a hinged door with two inlets for gas and two outlets through which air is displaced, an industry standard poultry transport module with drawers into which the birds are loaded after catching, and some monitoring equipment including gas sensors. The gas chosen for the purpose of culling poultry with this system is a mixture of 80% by volume of argon and 20% by volume carbon dioxide. This mixture is commercially available throughout the world as it's used for welding. Sufficient gas cylinders containing the argon carbon dioxide mixture will need to have been ordered through DEFRA procurement services at least 24 hours before the cull of birds commences. As a rough guide, half the content of one cylinder will be adequate to kill one module full of birds. Gas cylinders are filled to extremely high pressures about 270 pounds per square inch and therefore they need to be stored securely, handled and moved carefully. The cylinders are opened or closed by turning a circular screw valve. Each operator will require the following equipment. A carbon dioxide personal monitor, an approved respirator, safety goggles, leather gloves for handling gas equipment, rubber boots, correct health and safety procedures must be followed. Regulators are attached to the gas cylinders and act as pressure reducing valves. They must be appropriate for the gas mixture and required rate of gas flow. Regulators must be fitted tightly to the cylinder before turning on the gas mixture by opening the screw valve. Gas cylinders must be closed before the regulator is disconnected from the cylinder. Delivery tubes must be appropriate to handle the gas delivery pressure, which can be up to five atmospheric pressures, five bar. Thin tubing, such as that used in garden hoses, is not safe. The delivery tubes must have appropriate connectors at either end, one to connect to the regulator and the other to the CGU. The container is a gas-tight empty vessel designed to accommodate an industry-standard poultry transport module. 
At one end, a hinged door is fitted. The door has a rubber seal fitted to make the container leak-proof. Each container is fitted internally with eight disposable plastic gas diffusers, connected in series to the delivery tubing that runs from the gas cylinders. Gas exits these diffusers at low pressures and gas flow is directed towards the floor so that birds are minimally disturbed by the gas flow. The diffusers also act as silencers. In the roof of the container, two vents exist, covered with a flexible rubber seal. These vents enable air in the container to be displaced as the container is filled with the gas mixture. Birds are caught in the home shed by catchers and placed in industry standard poultry transport modules. The catching of birds is a skilled and physically demanding task and should only be undertaken by those who've received appropriate training and are sufficiently skilled. The use of rough, aggressive techniques will result in poultry panicking and becoming stressed and injured, causing bone breaks, joint dislocations and bruising, leading to unnecessary suffering. Broilers must be caught with both legs and should be carried with both legs with a maximum of three birds in each hand. The Humane Slaughter Association has produced a leaflet on welfare-friendly catching and handling of poultry. This leaflet must be read and followed by all those involved in catching and handling before undertaking this procedure. Birds should be placed in the drawers at the standard stocking density that's used when transporting them. Modules are moved by means of a forklift truck Drivers should be skilled and experienced in moving the modules. When full of birds, modules should be moved carefully and smoothly, with no sudden or jerky movements. The module fits snugly into the container, and so lifting the module into the CGU should be undertaken with care. Do not close the door until the gas is going to be administered. It's essential to establish less than 5% by volume oxygen in the CGUs to ensure humane and rapid death in the birds. Continuous measurement of oxygen should be made at a level just above the highest drawer of the module. A reliable and robust oxygen analyzer should be selected for use. It should be handled, used, maintained and calibrated according to the manufacturer's instructions. When a containerized gassing unit, CGU container, is being filled, the gas mixture fills from the bottom and rises to the top, displacing air as it does so. This creates an atmosphere in which the oxygen level falls to less than 5% by volume, which is insufficient to sustain life. Turn off the gas once a concentration of less than 5% oxygen has been reached. Note that due to their greater resistance to anoxia, when killing ducks and geese, an oxygen concentration of less than 2% must be established and maintained. This is achieved by continuing the gas flow until the oxygen meter reads less than 2%. Note that this will take a little longer than achieving less than 5% and may affect the rate of killing. Birds close to the floor are exposed to the gas mixture well before those birds in the top of the container. Therefore, birds may start to convulse at different times, depending upon the rate of fill. Listen for flapping. Flapping may continue for up to two and a half minutes. Allow a further minute, and if no further noise has been heard, the CGU can be emptied. If noise is heard, check that the oxygen concentration has not risen. If the oxygen concentration has risen, the gas must be turned on again. When all bird movement and noise has ceased, open the door and remove the module of dead birds with the forklift. As the door is opened, ensure that nobody stands directly in front of the open CGU, as the gas mixture will pour out of the container to be dispersed safely into the air.
Immediately after removing the module from the CGU, all birds must be checked by appropriately trained staff to ensure that they are dead. Dead birds will show the following features. Absence of breathing. Check for respiratory movements by observing the bird's abdomen. Absence of eye reflexes. There should be no response to light pressure on the eyelid. Absence of vocalization. Absence of muscle tension. The carcasses should be limp and there should be no voluntary muscle activity. Disposal of birds must be undertaken with due consideration for the health and safety of staff undertaking the work and the need to reduce environmental contamination with potentially infected material as much as possible. Ideally, the procedure should be undertaken in a semi-enclosed environment to reduce loss of feathers from the birds. Prior spraying of the carcasses with disinfectant will help to reduce contamination. It's desirable to perform this procedure in an area that can be readily cleansed and disinfected after unloading has finished. The dead birds need to be removed from the drawers of the module for disposal. This is best achieved firstly by lifting the module onto a raised surface. Two operatives then pull each drawer out from the module and tip the dead birds into a suspended heavy-duty sack directly beneath. Checks must be made to ensure all the birds are dead before tipping. Alternatively, drawers are pulled out and birds can be lifted manually into disposal sacks. Once full, the sack should be closed and hoisted into a bulker vehicle for movement to a rendering or incineration unit. Emptying drawers is heavy, demanding manual work. There should be regular rotation of staff assigned to this job. Removal of dead birds does need to be undertaken carefully. Dead birds may pose a zoonotic infection risk. Every effort should be taken to reduce contamination of the surrounding area through spread of feathers, secretions and excretions. A separate detailed standard operating procedure has been produced for use on site. Subsequently, carcasses can be transported either in the bags, which may be tied to provide additional biosecurity, or the carcasses can be tipped into a lorry, specially designed for transporting potentially infected waste products of animal origin. This lorry should contain all waste material, prevent leakage of any fluids and be able to be sealed. It should be clearly marked to indicate what category of waste product it's able to transport. The lorry will then transport the carcasses to a place of disposal, which will either be a rendering facility or an incineration facility. There will always be an escort following on behind to ensure there's no seepage of content during the journey. After use and before the CGUs and ancillary kit are moved off the infected premises, all parts of the kit must be cleaned using an appropriate cleaning agent to remove gross contamination and dirt before being disinfected. One of the most important means of spreading the infectious viruses of birds, such as avian influenza, is by means of inanimate objects becoming covered in virus-contaminated material. When moved from one premises to another, they can spread infection. It's therefore essential that disinfection is done carefully and effectively, as the modules and containers may be contaminated with infectious particles. A disinfectant approved by the state veterinary authorities for killing the infectious agent must be used according to the manufacturer's instructions or any local instructions that exist. In particular, the correct concentration must be achieved and the disinfectant replaced as appropriate when it becomes too contaminated. All parts of the CGU and ancillary kit must be effectively exposed to the correct concentration of disinfectant for the correct length of time. The kit should then be allowed to dry in air prior to packing up for onward transport. The CGUs must always be locked after use. 
workers that undertake this task must be aware of the health and safety measures they should be adopting and wear appropriate personal protective equipment throughout the cleansing and disinfection procedure. This training aid has described the safe and effective use of the containerized gassing unit to kill large numbers of birds as might be required during any outbreak of infectious disease in birds. During any large-scale cull of birds, infected or otherwise, it's important that the welfare of each bird is considered and that a humane death is delivered to each and every animal. A number of important considerations must be borne in mind when operating the CGU system to kill infected birds. All staff involved in the operation of the CGUs should be fully aware of the standard operating procedures that apply to their use and should have received specific training to enable them to undertake their role. Adequate personal protective equipment must be worn correctly throughout the process of handling any potentially infected material when working with the CGUs and in any case whenever personnel are working on infected premises. A period of acclimatization will be required for staff to familiarize themselves with the operation of the CGUs. Ideally, dummy runs should be undertaken before any birds are put through the system. Once staff are familiar with their roles, operation of the system is rapid and effective, and the throughput can be as much as four to 5,000 birds per hour when two CGUs are operating in tandem. It's essential that staff wear personal gas monitors to monitor exposure to the gas and understand the effects that gas can have on humans if it's inhaled. Birds should be caught by trained and competent staff and loaded into transport modules at normal stocking densities. It's essential that the oxygen level in the CGU is brought below 5% and is maintained at this level until all birds are dead. Prior to disposal, all birds must be checked to ensure that they are dead. Any that exit the CGU showing signs of life should be killed immediately using an emergency killing procedure such as a percussion gun or neck dislocation. Dead birds must be disposed of in a way to minimize possible environmental contamination. All equipment must be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected. All efforts should be taken to protect the welfare of the birds and every bird should be handled and killed humanely. It's also essential to remember that for those involved in the cull, farmers, farm staff, personnel working for the state veterinary authorities and any contracted workers, the work can not only be physically demanding but emotionally draining. Everyone should be aware of the vital contribution they're making to protecting public health and animal health by working towards stamping out outbreaks of infectious disease. Consideration of the health and safety of staff must always remain the prime consideration during any cull. The destruction of large numbers of birds is never a pleasant task, but the correct operation of the CGU system, as described in this training aid, will enable the humane killing of large numbers of birds when disease outbreaks arise and birds need to be killed for disease control purposes.